I mean, we got two grandpas up in here. <laughs> um, so like, I got started in college, because uh, first I was like, man, I don't, I don't have time for this, I gotta, I gotta get my degree. And then, because I was an English major, which, <laughs> that's not a degree, uh, the, the English department was like, hey, do you do any blogging? I was like, no, but I could. They were like, yeah, we'll give you credit for that. I'm like, you don't say. And so I did. And, uh, and that's how I got started up with it. And so I think I'm probably the only person associated with Chiptunes Win to make any actual profit off of it. Because <laughs> at least I, I got that out of it. Um, but anyway... Uh, so like I say, I've been doing that for about three years, uh, and I don't know, cool thing about that, uh, you get to meet a lot of nice people, um, and sometimes people know you from the internet. Um, what's actually kind of fun is, uh, I don't know, in the three years that I've been writing, I've learned how to go from like, I'm a pretentious English major who has words and opinions about a thing to someone who somebody might actually give a shit about, uh, which is sort of the first point I wanted to touch on. Uh, it's really easy to sound like a pretentious fuckwad on the internet. Uh, it is also very easy to do so when talking about music. Uh, and if you understand this and try really hard not to be, then you set yourself apart and people might actually care about what you're talking about. Um, I also find what happens a lot these days is a lot of websites will just uh, plagiarize somebody else's article about something. Uh, it'll be like, hey, uh, we, uh, we're good? Those are the slides, right? No, I didn't have any slides. I'm sure they're still there, sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, so somebody who has no idea about anything about what the music actually is or like how it's made or whatever, they'll just see that somebody else posted an article and grab it and then restate it and put a link to the original article in the first place uh, without actually contributing anything meaningful to it. Um, this doesn't happen so much in the chiptunes world because there aren't a whole lot of people writing about it now, <laughs> but, uh, but stuff that's bigger and like goes on BuzzFeed and stuff, like you get these people who just grab stuff, call it their own, and are done with it. And I guess that's how real internet journalism works, but that sucks, don't do it. Um, I don't know, like YouTube guys, like you, you're talking about you love metal. What's, uh, what's your favorite kind of music? Um, that's a hard question. Um, what, f what kind of music do you like to talk about the most? Probably. Shit, that's a hard question. <laughs> I don't know, I listen to everything, man. Well, that's fine. So, I mean, let's, let's go with metal then. Like, if you had. If you had some guy from, I don't know, from Joe Schmo website who goes and grabs something off of, uh, I don't know, I actually know this is perfect. So let's say, let's say somebody who doesn't know grabs something off of the hard times, right? <laughs> the, the, the parody website for, for punk and hardcore. So like, let, let's say somebody who doesn't know just goes and grabs a plausible article off of the hard times. Uh, like they don't, they don't understand, right? Like they don't get that it's a joke, and so it ends up wildly spinning everything out. Yeah, they don't get that uh, only, the only reason David Bowie died was so God could make his own super group. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but so it's things like there. There's not a whole lot of research that goes into these things, and sometimes you'll just get somebody who has an opinion about something, and uh, and spoilers, opinions are like genitalia. Uh, it's great if you have them, but you probably shouldn't show them to people who don't want to see them. Like, but unfortunately, the internet is not structured like that. Um, the internet says, I have an opinion, and you get to see it uh, if my Google count is high enough. Um, so it's one of those things where, like, if you're going to write something about something, you should do two things. One, actually be knowledgeable about whatever the hell it is that you're talking about. And I'm not saying you have to have a PhD in heavy metal, but like, you should at least, I don't know, maybe be familiar with the band you're talking about and maybe some of their influences. Is that actually a PhD in Taiwan? Uh, you know, I'm sure there's a small enough university somewhere that'll give you a PhD in heavy metal. <laughs> um, Try a uh, try University of Phoenix online. No. Uh, <laughs> but no, um, so it's one of those things, like, 
it's important to know if you're going to talk about a band, like if you're going to talk about a new album release, which is what I normally do, it's important to know who that person is, what they've done before, how long they've been doing it, and other generally useful information, like are they on tour right now, and basic shit like that. The way, uh, I was actually going to bring up articles, but I, I didn't want to bring up the back end of the Chiptunes Win website, just in case. Um, but like, so the way I structure my articles, you've got a uh, little intro, you've got picture, line break, body of the thing, then at the very bottom, you've got an embed of the, uh, of the album, because 99 times out of 100, it's on Bandcamp. Uh, and then useful links down at the bottom, because at this point, like, yeah, you're reviewing whatever it is they're doing, but you sort of have an obligation to make sure that anybody who wants to actually listen to what you've talked about can actually get to it. Um, this is a fun social media thing that I wanted to get to, too. So, like, a lot of people, if you do it right, all of your social media links back to itself. Uh, this is really good brand management because if you have social media that doesn't link back to itself, you start getting gaps, right? And then sometimes people, uh, people who only use one type of social media but want to tell their friends about it can't because they're like, I don't know. If your SoundCloud doesn't have a link to your Facebook, right? Like, I mean, one, it, it means that you, don't, uh, you do ensure that you get to say, hey, bro, check my SoundCloud. Uh, but <laughs> But it's one of those things where it's like, basically everything gives you options to link to everything else. Facebook lets you link to Bandcamp and SoundCloud and a personal website and Twitter. Bandcamp lets you link to Facebook and SoundCloud. Actually, you may not be able to link to SoundCloud on, on Bandcamp. I haven't checked. Actually, but you, you, I heard like some bands, because they have to manage so many things. Yeah. Facebook, SoundCloud, Twitter, YouTube page, Bandcamp, Weaver of Nation. Um, Instagram. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's like, it's to the point where like you have like 15 different things to save it to. Yeah, well, so that's a very interesting point, right? Not only are there, uh, I guess, different social media outlets have different user bases, right? So like, you wouldn't wanna go and post a link to your article on Instagram, right? <laughs> like, that's not what people are there for, they're for pictures. But by the same token, there are a number of programs that allow you to manage multiple social media platforms at once. Um, MAGFest, for example, uh, uses Hootsuite, I believe, or at least Chiptune's Win does. Uh, Hootsuite is one that lets you put in Facebook and Twitter and a couple other things. Um, I know MAGFest specifically because I also help out with MAGFest social media. Um, you know, any once you've got multiple Twitter accounts, you can pull up TweetDeck. And so let's say, I don't know all the MAGFest accounts off the top of my head, but it's like, you know, MAGFest General and MAGFest Tech Ops and MAGFest something else. You can have them all pulled up in TweetDeck so that you could just cycle between the three of them and cross post and whatever. So it makes it really easy. Um, but you're right, like there are a lot of social media platforms f for people and it does get really overwhelming, especially because 99 times out of 100, the people who are in the band aren't necessarily marketing minded. Like, they're musicians. They're really good at playing music. They're maybe not so good at telling themselves. Um, and so it can be kind of a pain in the ass to learn. I will say I've learned everything I know over the past three years between Chiptunes Win and, uh, and doing stuff for MAGFest here. And it's, it's really one of those things that you just got to figure out which, uh, which venues to, to prioritize on if you can't do all of them, right? Like... If you're, if you're gonna post a picture of something, right? You're like, all right, well, I can send that to Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Like, great, okay. And as long as you put an obnoxious amount of hashtags in it, like, then people are gonna see what you're talking about. Everything's fine. Um, if you were just posting a link to your newest track on SoundCloud or whatever, maybe you just put it on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, and, you know, maybe, I don't know. Something that people like to do a lot is, you know, just take short videos of themselves, you know, playing something from the new album. That's something that can be posted, you know, Snapchat and Facebook and Twitter and all these things. And so you start figuring out which things can be put on which media and get the most results. Um, it is not a long process, but it is a process that is kind of a learned skill. Um, and really, you just kind of got to track it. Like, if you're someone who doesn't know anything about it, you're like, all right, well... I'm just gonna spend an hour every day making sure that all of these things go out to every possible platform, and then you just check and look at it and see which ones actually get hits. Um, obviously, 
we all know that Facebook's algorithms for, uh, for pages are horrendous, and you, you have to figure out how to optimize for that. Um, likewise, you know, Google search engine optimization is a thing where, like, you can actually get jobs for that. That is actually an employable skill. Um, so, like, it takes some effort to do, but, um, but once you start figuring out where to, where to put stuff, then you're good. Um, let's see. I don't know. Well, while we're here right now, I guess, do you guys have any questions about internet music journalism before I jump back into this? I said we've gained a couple of people since the beginning, so I want to make sure I didn't miss anything. From what was I thought it was internet music journalism? Oh, oh, no, no, no. Though I will say, actually, uh, in, in doing stuff for Chiptunes Win and for MAGFest, uh, I do end up doing a little bit of games journalism. Um, obviously, it can be a touchy subject these days, um, but as with, how to put this? All right, so Chiptunes Win operates under, uh, the, <laughs> under the most important tenet of the internet, which is don't be a dick, right? Um, constructive criticism is fine, but don't actively be a dick to anyone. So like for MAGFest, for example, the way I started out helping out with MAGFest is that they needed somebody to start running their blog uh, which, spoiler, there is a blog. There are three posts. Um, and those three posts are about PAX East because MAGFest had the jam space at PAX East this year. So um, they're like, we need somebody to you know, generate content for this. Great. Sounds great. Love it. And so while everybody else was busting their ass and making sure that the jam space went fine, my job was to go and have fun and play video games. <laughs> um, I still feel bad about that. But, um, but no, so the thing is, like, I got to go out. I saw people, you know, a lot of indie developers, some of whom come to MAGFest, um, like the guys who do 20XX, if you guys have seen that. I've heard of 20XX. Yeah, it's, it's the Mega Man-like. Um, it's Yeah, it's good. It's one of my roommate's favorite games. Um, but, but, yeah, so it's one of those where it's like, you know, you, you go out and mingle with people who have already been in the community, right? You're checking to make sure that you're checking up on them, make sure they're doing okay. You go out, you find new stuff, and then from there, it's the kind of thing where, like, you know, you, like, the article I wrote about it, it was just a quick blurb about everything. Anything I got to play, I was like, all right, check it out. This is the thing. This is why I liked it, or this is why I didn't like it. This is the developer's website. This is when it's due out. Here's, a, you know, the promo art for the game. Um, and then I made sure to tell everybody about MAGFest, because sometimes you just got to go spread the good word. Um, also, I should mention here, in case this goes up on the internet, uh, MAGFest Indie Video Game Showcase uh, application started this weekend. Um, so I told everybody at PAX about that. I was like, you've got an indie game. We have a festival. Maybe you should come down. Unfortunately, because it was in Boston, a lot of the people were in Canada. They're like, we don't really want to go to Maryland, but uh, whatever. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so there is a little bit of game journalism for these things. It's, it's one of those things where uh, either game journalism or live event reporting, uh, it ends up being part, uh, part of the same non-Euclidean coin, right? <laughs> Multiple sides of the same coin. Um, so yeah, it's, it's something like, yeah, you got to be mindful of. And basically, you just approach it the same way you do anything else. Don't be a dick. Talk about the good parts. And if there are bad parts, talk about them constructively. Um, because, like, you know, a lot of developers, I feel like, you know, if you say, the shit is terrible, like, whatever, they'll just write it off and they'll be like, all right, that guy's a dick. But <laughs> if, if somebody's like, oh, man, the, um, you know, I know this is a, a roguelike and it's got, you know, uh, procedurally generated levels and whatever, but it seems like the procedurally generated uh, tile blocks in this particular map set seem... Uh, like they're not being repetitive enough and it makes weird levels, right? That's something oddly specific enough that the developer's going to go, hey, you know what, that's, that's kind of useful. And maybe they'll go back and look at it and tweak the algorithm. Same with, um, you know, with shit for chiptunes, for example. Like, I really pick up on well-crafted percussion because if you guys know anything about chiptunes, which you did if you went to any of the chiptunes went concerts here at Mag Labs, wink, um, <laughs> then, uh, you know, it, a lot of chiptunes is learning how to program the music, right? Uh, or sample it, of course. But so it's one of those things where, like, if you're on a Game Boy, for example, there is no percussion channel. And so if you want to make a good snare drum, you got to combine the noise channel with the triangle to, to try and get, like, that good hit to it, right? Um, and so it's one of those things where, like, 
a person could go up and do this because, you know, LSDJ is one of the cheapest uh, audio softwares on the planet. Uh, but so you could go up and do this. And you know, if you don't know anything, it could be terrible. Uh, but people who really know how to do it really know how to make it sound good. And it's something you can immediately pick up on if you know what you're talking about and say, ah, yes, this person has clearly spent some time doing this. And you can talk about it. And this sort of goes back to the whole thing about know the hell what you're talking about. Uh, because, all right, I won't mention the artist's name, um, but there was a chiptune artist who put out an album earlier this year or late last year, uh, and who's primarily does a lot of metal. Uh, and so some metal magazines picked him up because uh, we're like, oh man, this is a neat gimmick. It's metal with also a Game Boy. And then they went through and they're like, wow, this sounds terrible. These beep and boops don't contribute to the metal at all. And, uh, and also this guy clearly doesn't know what the hell he's doing. And you know, all of us in the chiptune community laughed because uh, we're like, what do you, you, you guys, do you, do you not know? But, but they don't, and that's just it, is because if you're in a particularly small niche genre of music, or, uh, or macro genre, as I like to call chiptunes, because chiptunes can be anything. Um, but like, if you're in a very niche market for what you're talking about, you have to realize that like, you might be the only subject matter expert. Like, it might be, that's why, you know, when BuzzFeed picks up your article and says, they've got a Game Boy, isn't that cool? Retro! And, what, and don't understand anything about what you're talking about. Like, that's why, because they haven't had to know. You, however, have spent however many years as you have building up a knowledge of this. Um, which is why I encourage people to write about stuff you actually care about. Uh, this is this is actually something on the uh, the Chiptunes Win blog too. Is that we don't ever write about stuff we don't care about, like because Chiptunes are not necessarily easy to make, but the entry cost for making Chiptunes is very low, and anybody can make them. There are shitloads of releases every day, every week, like the uh, uh, August actually, just this last month. There were three, three chiptune festivals across America, I think. Uh, there was Low Level up in New York, which I went to. Uh, there was Little Sound Assembly, which I believe is in Ohio. Uh, there's Breakfest, I think, which just happened. There was something out in California. Like, so obviously I can't count, but like <laughs> there, there were all these things that just happened. And of course, all these musicians were like, oh, hey, by the way, I'm also gonna release my new album and play it at this festival. And so if you figure each of those festivals has, over the several days, you know, probably 10, 15 artists, if half of them go and release a new album every event, you figure suddenly, over the course of a month, you've got at least 50 releases. Again, math. But um, <laughs> well, let's say you've got a bunch of releases, and you can't just sit down. Like, we're not paid. There are obviously some music journalists that are paid. <laughs> but, uh, but like, you know, the, what I do, we're not paid for it. And so we got to sit down and be like, all right, which ones do we actually care about? Which ones can we sit down and actually talk about, right? Like, there's a bunch of artists that I really enjoy, but I've said the same thing about them pretty much every time I've written about them. And I'm like, you know what? I need to stop writing about them because there's nothing new to talk about. Um, like... Let's see. Uh, actually, I can't think of anybody specifically, but the, but it happens, right? You sort of burn out, and you're like, oh, man, this person really knows how to do this thing. Oh, shit. Do you know when they do this other thing? That's great. And that, But it's, that's their style, so they do it in every album. And so if you look back at those articles, you're like, hey, Adam talked about the fact that he did this thing, and then he did this other thing. And then the next article talks about he did that same thing. And that same thing, and it's not that the person isn't good or that they're not doing new stuff, but your view is kind of focused on that one thing. That's what you pick up on. To that end, uh, if you are writing on the internet, you should have multiple editors to look at your work. And I say this because, not, not necessarily over the same piece, but cycle who edits your work. Uh, also, spoiler, edit your work. Uh, <laughs> like, 
Again, I was an English major. I thought I could write done goodly. Uh, turns out, every once in a while, I was not perfect. Uh, and, and so it's one of those things where if you've, got, if you've got one person to edit your work, right, like at least they can go back and say, hey, you're making this problem, you know, this thing needs to go away or whatever. But if you keep using the same person over and over, what ends up happening is that you end up writing to what they want, right, because they've got their own idea of how your piece should sound. And so if they, if they hate the Oxford comma, for example, right, they're going to go through and edit out all your Oxford commas. Um, tyranny. <laughs> but, uh, but if you start cycling it around, like, again, with Chiptunes Win, we've got um, probably five people who do edits, um, in addition to all the people who write the stuff, and some of those editors also write things and whatever. It's a big blob of people. But, uh, but so it's the kind of thing where you're like, all right, well, you know, this month I'm, I'm writing the article and it's going to this guy. And then next month I'm writing my article and it's going to this person. And, and so on and so on. And that way you know that, you know, if you trust all of these people to actually be able to critique your work, which can also be a problem because you've got to make sure that the person editing your work knows how to edit and knows what you're talking about. Um, but as long as you trust them, you would be like, all right, this person picked up on this problem that I have. This person picked up on this problem that I have. And it ultima uh, ultimately makes you a better writer. Uh, let's see. All right, so we got half an hour left. What's something fun to talk about with internet journalism? Do you guys, again, do you guys have any questions about, like, I don't know, promoting things or things like that? Because I'm going to discuss some other things, but if you've got specific questions, I'd love to take them instead. <laughs> okay. Sure. Or bigger bands where they probably have a company hired to do their editing. Yeah, and that's fair, right? So like big bands have a media team, right? Like that's the gig, and that's awesome because that means that got those uh, those marketing uh, marketing degrees actually get jobs. <laughs> I went to VCU. I had a lot of friends who ended up in the marketing department who did not get jobs in their field because of oversaturation of the market. So I'm always happy when people actually get hired to do what they want to. But you're right, so like local bands, for example, like people who, people who don't do that, like people who have no idea, um, you have two options. Learn or find a friend and hopefully they know how to do it and get them to do it instead. Um, because obviously buying a big marketing team isn't, one, isn't very wise when you're still small, and two, may not actually matter um, so, like, for example, um, there is an event going on on October 1st in Richmond, Virginia, uh, which is a MAGFest Game Over concert. Uh, it is Game Over Richmond. Um, we have not talked about it on the MAGFest social media because Mag Labs and also registration. Uh, but, so, like, we haven't talked about it, right? We still have, I believe, between uh, interested and going, we still have about 300 people who have interacted with that page, which is, I think, 200 more people can fit in the venue. Uh, but, uh, but so it's one of those things where like, you don't necessarily have to be using a big media outlet, but what you do have to do is if you don't have that powerhouse behind you, you have to actually figure out what good outlets are to go and pimp your stuff. Uh, again, I went to college in Richmond, uh, popular things to do, printing out flyers and putting them on literally every telephone pole, um, finding local businesses, even the ones that you're not playing at. Like certain, I mean, obviously, like there's a, there's a bar in Richmond called Strange Matter that has a lot of stuff come through there. Uh, Anamana Gucci has played there a couple of times, things like that. Um, and so, you know, they've got their front window plastered in, uh, in posters. Um, so like, you know, going, yeah, okay, we do need to sink a little bit of money into getting some good posters made, you know, pay an artist to do something nice and put it up, right? Like, yeah, that's, that's a cost you should probably shoulder. Um, and, then, and then you figure out where people who like the things that you are selling or trying to promote go. Um, obviously, this is a lot easier to do when you're familiar with a town. If you're on tour or something, 
hopefully the people at the venues that you're playing have a promotion team and they can try and help you out a little bit. Um, but honestly, a good portion of what you got to do when you're small is just reach out to your friends. Like grassroots kind of stuff is important. So like, I mean, obviously for small, small bands, you know, sometimes 10 people at a show is all you can hope for, right? But Sometimes even that's the best promotion. Like, if you, if you play a show to 10 people and you just absolutely slay it, those 10 people are going to remember and tell all of their friends that like the same sort of shit that you did. And then the next time you guys come through there, or hopefully it's in your hometown so you can build up a following, like, then you know what? Then they're going to tell people and you start getting people coming in, giving you money, whatever, build it up. Perfect example, uh, DJ Cutman, MAGFest staple. My first MAGFest, uh, MAGFest 10, um, he was a uh, nobody peddling like home burnt CDs with like, uh, like the names written in marker in little ugly little jewel cases, uh, just trying to peddle his beats, right? Now, here we are six years later, uh, Chris Davidson has his own music label He's, uh, he's got his own podcast. He's got, you know, he, he's, he's, he is internet famous, right? <laughs> like, he, he is a household name at this point. Um, and it's literally, you, you just have someone who knows how to aggressively market themselves in the correct areas. He knew MAGFest was exactly where he needed to market, and he did. And suddenly he started connecting with other people who did the same things he did, and he built it up. That's another thing. Like, I have uh, I have a friend who was in a pop punk band, uh, which obviously, of course, meant that at some point he had to get out of this town. <laughs> but uh, I'm sorry, this is a terrible, terrible joke at the expense of pop punk. Uh, but so it's one of those things where like pop punk is one of those genres which is super, super niche, and only the people who really care about it are going to come out to it. So, but if you find enough people even on the same coast as you, to go and do a tour about it. Like, if you guys can share costs, suddenly it ends up being kind of okay. Um, I believe he and, like, two other bands played. His band was from here in Virginia. There was a band from Connecticut, and then there was another band from, I think, Baltimore. And so, like, the Connecticut guys came down, and they did, like, a little mini tour of, like, six cities. And it's one of those things that, like, if you perform... You build your fan base by playing with other people in that situation. Yeah, I'm trying to remember what they called it, but like, uh, show fest or something, or like, you can go to their town. Yeah. They, uh, like, you open for them, and then um, they come to your town. So they come to you, right? Yeah. And that's, that's how a lot of the music business works, because what you'll do is you'll have... Um, You'll have people in one town have a good relationship with various venues and promoters. And if you're friends with that person, you could say, hey, I want to come play in your town. And they'll go, oh, okay, well, I'll go talk to you know, Joe who owns Nerd Bar downtown. And, uh, and you go play. And great. Sometimes this leads to only a certain group of people ever playing in a town because then uh, there, there ends up being an accidental monopoly. But if you can avoid that, then it's great. Like... <laughs> um, but it also like encourages you to go out and make friends with a bunch of different people. Um, you know, again, going back to chip tunes, right? You've got um, uh, let's see, you had Pulse Wave uh, in wherever that was, and you had IO, uh, and there's um, Rochester Chip, right? And so, or sorry, Ro Rochester Chip is the group, but but you had you had like two or three different regular like monthly or semi-yearly events that would happen. And they sort of each had their own group of people that was playing in them. There would be a little cross-pollination, but like for the most part, it's like, all right, well, these guys have, or they, they know this town. They know where to play in this town. These guys know where to play in this town, and these guys know where to play in this town. So if I want to play in that town, I got to talk to them. And, and so you would do that, and they would sort of, not be like a like a booking agent, but they would be like, you know, hey, I'm trying to come up and play. Is there a show coming up that I can come play, or do you guys want to do a show or something like that? And it sort of lowered the um, 
the, the entrance fee, if you will, to actually trying to, uh, to do something. Because otherwise, you're just cold calling. And if you're not in a town that has a history of whatever kind of music you're doing, uh, you are probably going to have a bad time. <laughs> like, um, but then again, there's, there's some places that that's how they got known, right? If any of you guys have watched uh, Reformat the Planet, the, uh, the chiptune documentary from 2008, uh, that was that was kind of how they got that going. Is the the venue that they went to, um, you know, Bitshifter was just like, hey, I want to come play with this, and so he got signed on, and it was great. And the guy who ran it was like, you know what, I want more of that. And then a couple more guys came in, and you get your following. So, I guess yeah. The tying this back to actual internet music journalism, uh, if you are writing about shows, you have to be the one who tries to make it out to all these small things. Like if you know, if you know, for example, that you know, a bar that you go to is gonna have a show that has something you're even tangentially related to and is something that you write about, just go to it. Because your little podunk article on the internet in the middle of nowhere on your personal blog might be the only media coverage that that band gets. And suddenly, you know, you, you shoot them a message and say, hey, I wrote about your show on my blog. They're super hype because they had somebody that actually cared enough to write about their stuff. They'll share your information. You'll get followers. You'll share their information to any of your followers. They'll get followers. And suddenly you, you have this pretty positive relationship. Um, I, I know there have actually been times where, like, I go and write an article on the Chiptunes Win website, and the, the person that I wrote it about was like, hey, thanks. Like, I was actually able to sell some CDs thanks to, thanks to your article. Actually, that, that is something specific that I go to shows weekly. Yeah. Truly weekly. And yeah, half of them are, in fact, local shows. And that's something I could do. I don't know where it would post things or do things for it. Or I don't know how like, the format of how I would talk about specific like, a show or interview or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Actually, that's a great thing to talk about. Um, as to where to post it, uh, WordPress is great. Um, WordPress is actually what Chiptunes Win runs on. Um, MagFest stuff runs on Webhook, uh, which is a different thing. Um, Webhook is obviously more for you know people who are building up a big site that need it to post and whatever. Uh, but it is functionally like WordPress. WordPress, of course, is kind of the standard at this point. Um, but I'm fairly sure you can just go make your own thing. Alternately, Blogspot uh, is still around, apparently, um, and is not just for people uploading pirated shows. Uh, but um, he says as he adjusts his Steven Universe hat. Uh, but, um, you know, it's one of those things where, like, you, you can go make your own blog. Um, there, there was, again, in the Chiptunes world, there was a guy by the name of Peter Swim uh, who ran a website called True Chip Till Death. Uh, and he was, like, the only outlet for chiptune news for a very long time. Um, and then he ended up stepping back from it, and then a couple years later, chiptunes win happened. But, um, but you know, he was just someone who's just like, I'm, I'm just going to write about this. Um, there are a couple of other musicians who also do, you know, hardware modifications and things like that and have a, have a broad enough scale of interests where they're like, all right, I'm going to have my home website and that will function as both my blog and you know my, my website for contacting things. And so at that point, they're writing about either stuff that they're doing or shows that they're going to or things like that. And so if you follow that artist, then you're already on their website. Um, you know, in your case, for example, I don't know if you also do music or anything like that, but uh, but like if you did, then you would have a, a perfect thing for it because then you know if you if you had a simple website and a YouTube channel, right? You've got your website. You can embed the YouTube videos into uh, into your website, uh, or even if you did it through WordPress. Um, you know, if you were to you know put up articles, uh, you embed the YouTube video and just you know talk about it for a sec. Um, and then have other posts that are just you talking about whatever's going on, like you've got it all sort of linked back in central, in one central location. And going back to having the, the feedback loop, if you've got a blog spot with embeds to your YouTube, your YouTube should have links to your blog spot. Um, but anyway, specifically talking about live shows, right? So you don't wanna go and summarize every single event that happened. 
uh, because you're not Hunter S. Thompson. And, um, well, except for that one guy here who is Hunter S. Thompson. He's Hunter S. Thompson. Everybody else is not Hunter S. Thompson. Uh, but so, like, yeah, I, I mean, unless you're pulling a Hunter S. Thompson and you're high on numerous things all weekend and you want to talk about how you shouldn't stay here because it's bat country and, you know, you had to talk about the, you went to go see this show and suddenly it hit you and then you were outside face down in the pool and somebody brought you back. Like, okay, sure. Like, that's a crazy enough thing that, like, people are probably going to read that. But otherwise, if you're like, I got to the venue at 3 o'clock, I tried out their hamburgers, and they were good. Then I sat and talked to some of my friends. That was fun. Until 6. Until 6. Then and, two. Yeah. <laughs> and then I readjusted my shoelaces and walked into the back where the concert... No, don't ever do that. <laughs> like, just... <laughs> Pick the high points, right? Like, again, this is where it helps to be knowledgeable about, uh, like, creation methods of whatever they're doing. Uh, like, for example, for, for metal or actually any rock. Um, you know, if you know, like, oh, shit, this band, you know, they bought a couple of new pedals uh, and, you know, they were able to do this cool thing. Like, I'll bring this back to chip tunes for a sec. There's a guy named Danimal Cannon um, who, like, he bought a Hatsune Miku effect pedal uh, the Vocaloid. So, like, he can't ever publish music with that uh, because it's actually a licensing issue. It's the only one of the Vocaloids where you have to go through and get licensing rights to, to use any of that stuff. Uh, but he can do it at live shows, right? And so that's something that people are going to care about because that's not something they can hear anywhere. So if you're like, oh, shit, Dan got up on stage and he started doing crazy wah effects and he's got the, the Vocaloid patch on and it was crazy. Like, this is something that people are going to care about. But if, if you're up there and you're like, he was playing this chord, and then he stepped on a pedal, and then it changed the sound quality, and that was neat. Like, shut up! Nobody cares! <laughs> Don't do it! Um, so, again, I've said it 800 times. Be knowledgeable about what the hell you're talking about. Going back to, um, to actual like, layout of stuff, what I do when I do event write-ups, um, I will try and interview the people who like put it together. Um, I've actually got an article about low level going up at some point if I can hear back from them soon. Uh, but so like it was one of those things where it's like, all right, I'm going up to this. I'm going to shoot them a couple of messages um, because I want to know, you know, how it started, uh, who's involved with it, things like that. Also basic information of like, do you have a copy of the show? Like, because a lot of these times, just like we're doing now, uh, stuff will be live streamed, or if it's not live streamed, they will have a professional, you know, video team out there grabbing something, or or maybe not. Like there's there's a couple of artists who will just upload stuff to their own pages and then tell people about it. Um, there's a musician named Carl Pachinski who has about 800 different aliases, uh, but his uh, his YouTube channel um, he'll always take videos at shows that he's at on this crazy retro uh, like 90s camcorder um and so it's really great you get a like a nice video quality to it and uh and so he does those and he always posts them and you you can always count on like four or five of them going up from whatever event that he's at and so like if you know that ahead of time you're like all right well i'll keep an eye on his on his thing and if he was there then he's gonna post it um but if not then you, you hit up the organizers like you know do you have any info about this do you have any promo pictures do you have anything like that again the chiptune community is sort of small, so you know, it's like, all right, well, there's one or two people who always show up to shows in this chunk of the world, and they always post their photos to Flickr. So, all right, great. I'm going to keep an eye on their page, and they'll upload it, and they're always cool if you take their pictures and, you know, link back to them and attribute to their work. Uh, great. Okay, good. So you got that. Um, you're talking to the, the people who started the venue. If you can't get a hold of them, fine. It just means that you don't get to talk about sort of how it started. But, like, I always try and give a short history of the venue. Um, some venues have really interesting histories with whatever the music scene is. Sometimes not. Uh, Low Level, for example, was in a warehouse space called The Muse in Brooklyn, New York, which is normally like, uh, like a circus space. Like, you've usually got people doing, like, aerialist work and stuff like that because it's just this big open warehouse. Uh, so, like, that's cool. That's a thing that people might care about. Uh, and so once you've sort of got that knocked out, then I'm like, all right, uh, you know, this was sort of the lead up. 
like, again, with low level, for example, they had an arcade set up, sort of like MagFest. Um, and so it's like, all right, this is why they had the arcade. This is who provided it. Um, here's some fun facts about it. Great. And then you get to the actual music stuff. And you can either go act by act and say, you know, this person was up first. They, um, you know, they absolutely killed it. They did X, Y, and Z thing. And just sort of keep it brief and go, you know, bam, 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 hit them out. Or you can take the approach of just sort of talking about the highlights overall. You know, you can say, you know, it was really crazy. You know, at, at low level, we had anything from people doing like 90s house rave kind of crazy stuff to happy hardcore. You had some chiptune people coming out. You had, you had all this stuff, you know, and you had like this block where it was this guy after this guy after this guy, and they did X, Y, and Z thing, and they had these visualists up, and it was really cool because they were blah, blah, blah. And so you can basically, as long as you avoid run on sentences, like I just didn't. Yeah, I think, uh, <laughs> Yeah. And I've read a couple of them, and I think he does more of the act by act, or like disband the this, uh, or the not the this, or how when the, a band was on stage, I, the only thing I remember is he talked about how he acted, or a participant um, was the was everyone compared to the band. Yeah. Of like, was the let's say was the artist really important? Like, okay. Yeah. No, that is a great thing to talk about. And other other weird things that you notice during the show are also fun. Like things that, like if you can convey part of the experience to someone who is not there, people really enjoy the article. For example, when I was at um, Strange Matter in Richmond uh, at one of the um, one of the early Anamanaguchi shows, right after they had done Endless Fantasy, I say early in that era of the band rather. Um, but so, like when I was at one of their like first Endless Fantasy tour shows, um, there actually ended up being rain clouds of sweat that were happening because the humidity hit 100% in the venue because it's this dinky little venue that has really low ceilings and you have a bunch of sweaty nerds in there dancing around. And so the fact that I could be like, yes, like we got rained on because we were too sweaty. Like that's something that people are like, oh my God, I can't believe that. Like, oh, that's so weird. Or, oh man, I remember when that happened to me when I was at a punk show or whatever. Or maybe not. Maybe I'm just hoping that they think that, and actually people are like, that's gross. I don't care about that. But, <laughs> um, but it's just like weird little things. Or, you know, talking about, you know, especially if there's like fun graffiti or something outside, right? Like something that helps people connect to the venue and experience it, even though they weren't really there, right? Uh, like, like a MAGFest thing, of course, would be like, and nobody should do this, but like if somebody had spray painted Dom Love's butts on, on something, right? Like that's hilarious, right? Like people are like, ah, in jokes, LOL, Dom Love's butts. But like, uh, but like things like that where you're just like, this is something that is unique to this event. This is something that happened and will never happen again. And if you can grab those things and convey them in your work, then people like reading it. Because otherwise, they just get the same thing that they could have gotten from watching a YouTube video. Like, which I will admit, I have gone back and watched YouTube videos of concerts, especially anything that I've had to do at MAGFest. I will always go back and watch the concerts just to make sure that I didn't miss anything. Um, but, uh, but yeah, like, just go back and as long as you've got everything that happened in your head, or as much as you can, pick the stuff that you remember. And then once you've done like once you've done that and just sort of brain hemorrhaged everything onto a page, go back if you can, if there's a recording of the thing, go back and watch it and touch and be like, oh yeah, I forgot that this happened when they were playing this song. And you know, go back and add it in and add it in and then edit it out. What you don't want to do is make it a giant rambly mess. Because when you're on the internet, people only have short attention spans. Um, you know, sometimes people do show up and they're like, I really want to read about this event. And like, so when I did stuff about PAX, it was huge. But I broke it up where I was like, all right, this is the music portion, this is the gaming portion. If you're just here for this, control F, uh, hashtag music, and you'll go to this chunk of the page. Otherwise, do control F, hashtag uh, games, and you'll jump down to the bottom of the page. And then if you're, you know, if it's something you want to go back to and you're like, I just want to hear the music, or I just want to see what games he played, or whatever. 
then you don't have to engage with the whole article, and then you don't get people who, uh, who hit you with the TLDR. So there's that. Uh, we are just about out of time. Um, hopefully that giant rambling mess answered your question of what to do when you're writing about live events. Uh, do you have other questions? No, okay, that's fine. Um, let's see, I would say, that's fair. Um, something that you can do that I don't necessarily like to do, but if you become well enough known, uh, if you're writing for something, you can always ask the event uh, that you wanna write about for, uh, for a press badge, um, or you know, press tickets. Like I said, usually with smaller things, uh, I like to support the venue, or you know, support it so that it'll keep happening, but if you get well enough known, you, know, you could just say, you, you know, your, uh, your clout on the internet <laughs> is, uh, is enough to just, you know, maybe warrant it. You go up and say, hey, I'm so-and-so and I write for this. Like, would you be willing to let me, you know, come in and write about stuff and maybe interview some people and stuff? And sometimes people are all for it. Like, sometimes people are like, oh man, we don't have any media coverage. Like, we would love to not have to pay for that. That would be great. Um, and so, you know, you get in there. Or if you're writing about uh, albums or things, a lot of the times the artists are willing, especially people on Bandcamp because it's so easy, uh, you know, it'll just, they'll be like, or if you're like, hey, I'd like to write about your album and promote it on XYZ Place, they'll be like, sure, here's a promo copy. Like, listen to it, tell your friends, whatever. Um, like I said, it's not something to abuse, but it is something that when you reach a certain level of notoriety, it's not unfeasible to ask. Um, like I say, it's not something I try to do a whole lot, but more, more with album reviews than live events. But, um, so that's, that's definitely a thing. And if you're gonna do something like that, be sure that you actually do something good for that person. I'm not saying like lie. Like if they, if, um, or like, so Bandcamp's a perfect example, talking about uh, don't write about stuff you don't like. If you go through and you go to that person's Bandcamp page and you click on one song and you're like, that sucks, but, I don't have anything to write about, so I guess I'll just hit them up. And then you're like, hey, can I get a promotional copy of your album so I can write about it? And they're super happy because we're like, yeah, I'd love to. And then you're like, all right, well, you know, the, this is a six track album and it probably should have just been the single. And, uh, you know, it's pretty terrible, but I mean, I guess you could just go by that one track. Or like, don't, don't fucking do that. Like, if you know you only like one of the, one of the things that they're doing, don't do it. Like, just save your save both yourselves the hassle because you end up burning out the band too because they'll think they're just gonna get screwed over. Um, but anyway, I'd say that's probably a good place to wrap up because we got a couple minutes and I think they want to break down the panel room. So, yeah. So thanks for coming out, guys. Uh, hopefully you learned something. Uh, and like I say, if you go to chiptuneswin.com/blog. Uh, that's where I write, uh, me and a couple other people. So you can poke around. My handle on there is the Chip Wintern, because uh, I started off as an internship. So uh, there's that. Otherwise, thanks for coming out, guys. <laughs>